you. Thanks, Rowan. We will be recording this evening's session. So if um, you don't want to be seen, uh, then um, you know, put your video, turn your video off. And if you want to ask a question, um, don't necessarily include your name. Um, in terms of um, questions, there will be a chat in the chat if you could enter the question and Rowan will read it out. Um, the chat will be available to everyone, so you'll be able to see other questions that are being asked, so you don't necessarily double up. Um, and like I said, uh, as we know, the, the session's being recorded. So how we'll go is um, I'll ask uh, representatives of the three parties, Greens, Labor and Liberal, in alphabetical order. I think that's alphabetical order. Yep. Um, just to speak for five minutes about their records and their policies heading into this election. Um, if the parties have more than one candidate here, then they're welcome to share that time so that each, you know, each candidate gets to say a few words about their candidacy. Um, and there are independents, not non-party aligned people on, on the, in the, in the forum as well. And I'll also ask them uh, after the party speak to speak a bit about their records and, and their commitments. Uh, not for five minutes, if we could make it like two or three minutes, that'd be great. Um, and I'll try and keep everyone to time. Uh, once we've reached the limit, five minute limit or two or three minute limit, I'll just put my finger up or put a sign up and you'll know that it was time to wrap up. Um, and then after that, we'll have questions. Uh, I know that there's a few people online who've got some questions. So um, the sooner we're able to get to those, the better. Has anyone got any questions for me about how we're going to run things this evening? No? Great. Okay, let's get into it. Um, like I said, alphabetical order, the Greens first, uh, Rosalie's online, and I can see Jade's online as well. Um, if you'd like to take five minutes to talk a bit about uh, record and policies and what's on offer for this election. Uh, Rosalie, you're on mute. I am. Thank you, Rodney. Welcome, everybody. And I acknowledge that wherever we're um, on Zoom today in Lutruwida, we're meeting on stolen ground, land that has never been ceded. And the Greens work uh, with, uh, I think, everyone else in our community here online towards truth, uh, justice and treaty and inclusion for all people. Uh, well, the Greens have got a very uh, long and proud history of um, leadership in LGBTQIA plus rights. We were the first party in Tasmania to support the decriminalisation of homosexuality and cross-dressing. And we were the first to table a significant relationships bill and an anti-discrimination bill. We were the first party in the country to table a same-sex marriage bill. And we pushed for and achieved expungement of wrongful convictions. We know that a lot more needs to be done in that space in particular. We're part of pushing for LGBTIQA plus inclusion in schools, healthcare, sporting and uh, community facilities, and we continue that work, which is so important today. We're very proud of our role in uh, introducing and negotiating and passing legislation, and I acknowledge Sue and Ella, uh, and it was... Uh, for me, the happiest day I've had in my time in Parliament so far when that bill passed. It was um, enormously uh, world-leading legislation to um, gender affirmation laws. I consider myself to be a very um, close ally of this community. I've had long-term relationships with women. I've lived, uh, I've worked on the in the AIDS Council in the ACT uh, for many years, uh, and I feel very close and connected with this community. Um, I feel very passionate about, uh, and all members of the Greens too, uh, fighting and standing with the community for equality and respect. And we're very proud to have a party that I lead that provides uh, support and inclusion for open LGBT. GTA QA plus um, representation, and I'm so proud to have Jay Darko standing uh, for us in in Franklin, um, and you know she is just uh, such an incredible leader and speaker in our community. 
We have a rainbow network in the Greens that helps inform our policy and um, many of those people, I think, are participating tonight. So our election policy for this election builds on our history of fighting for uh, against discrimination, for redress for past injustices, and to continue to build the legislative framework that we need to support inclusion in Tasmania. So we want to, in the next term of parliament, fight to end um, the harmful conversion practices, to prohibit medically unnecessary interventions on children with innate variations of sex characteristics, to create an LGBTIQA plus inclusion act so that we can have mandated, um, updated uh, action plans, uh, a government community reference group and an LGBTIQA plus um, inclusion commission. Uh, I know from the work that I've done on one of the parliamentary committees I sit on uh, that we have to have um, a an LGBTIQA QA plus service sector that is uh, stable uh, into the long term. We need five year funding and it has to be fully indexed and the Greens support both of those things. We need hate crime legislation to protect against uh, violence towards sex orientation, uh, people with um, on the basis of gender identity and innate variations of sex characteristics and other things that people uh, you know, find to be hateful towards members of our community. We stand for community belonging and safety, and that's why we support uh, a push to have a pride centre It'd be amazing to have mental health services and primary health care services that genuinely uh, meet people on the on the terms uh, of who they are, are respectful and safe places. We know at the moment that people aren't receiving primary care because they can't have safe places to go. We also want mandatory training for government service workers in uh, essential organisations like health, education, the police, emergency services, uh, so that people understand um, the needs uh, of, of, of every, every person in the community and how to respond appropriately. So we're very, very proud of our history of fighting and standing up for this um, community and um, at, we have enduring support to continue in this space. Uh, we know that there are many dark forces in our community and, uh, you know, we our message to the community is that the Greens will be there, will continue to be there fighting and standing for dignity, uh, for respect and for equality. And we really look forward to working with you all in the next term of Parliament to make it the best we possibly can. Thanks, Rosalie. Um, uh, I'll hand over to uh, Ella uh, and Stuart in a second. I forgot in my introduction to mention that, of course, um, the response of the parties and candidates independents to the Equality Tasmania survey is on our website, equalitytasmania.org.au election 2024. Uh, we'll put that in the chat. And uh, there are some candidates, some independents who couldn't be here this evening, uh, um, but you can see their responses on our election page. Um, so uh, with that said, I'll hand over to Ella and Stuart uh, five minutes from now. Thank you. Thanks, Rodney. Um, and thanks, Rosalie. There's a lot of um, shared goodwill and um, shared policy objectives, I think, uh, um, I We'll hear from Nick as well, but I know that when the three of us have sat at estimates tables together, it has felt like there are three very strong supporters of the LGBTIQA plus community sitting around that um, table. Uh, the Labor Party has also a very strong and proud history of supporting uh, LGBTIQA plus equality and diversity. Um, that's uh, the case for our national party, for the Labor Party nationally, um, but in particular it's the case of the Tasmanian branch of the Australian Labor Party. We're committed to continuing to build on that when uh, when we form a government, hopefully very soon in the next few days. Um, it's former Attorney General Judy Jackson who introduced the Relationships Act, which was uh, in some ways might seem a little outdated now since we have achieved marriage equality at a national level, but at the time it was a very important legal protection provided by the Tasmanian state government for people in same-sex relationships. Similarly, Judy introduced um, the Anti-Discrimination Act, which 
um, remains very much a nation leading act in terms of protecting people from discrimination on the grounds of sexuality and gender, along with a whole lot of other protected attributes as well. Um, the birth certificate law reform that we achieved in 2019 that Rosalie referenced as well, I agree with you, Rosalie, it's actually the proudest moment that I've had in my uh, five years in the Tasmanian Parliament and each time we face election I think to myself if I lose my seat, uh, which I hope I don't, I still feel that that is the, the one thing that I've achieved that's made a really significant impact on the Tasmanian community and it's a thing that I'm proudest of. I really want to recognise Sue Hickey, who I know is on the call tonight as well, because uh, without Sue, we wouldn't have been able to do it. So for people who don't remember that history, it was that at that time, 10 Labor members, two Greens members in Rosalie and Cathy and Sue, who bravely crossed the floor. I think we counted up 21 times. And I know there was enormous pressure on Sue um, at that time. And it wasn't as easy as just supporting one vote on one bill. It was a it was a very, very long debate that we had twice, once in the lower house, once in the upper house, and then the second, sorry, three times, third time in the lower house, um, to achieve that really groundbreaking law reform, which I believe um, provides very significant protections for trans and gender diverse Tasmanians. Um, we've had a dedicated shadow ministry of equality um, as part of Rebecca White's shadow cabinet, and that's uh, been me for the last uh, three and a half years. And we're committed to having a dedicated minister for equality in a Labor cabinet as well. We're committed to banning conversion practices and acknowledge that the bill that's on the table is not um, so it not fit for purpose. It won't. It's actually not tabled yet. Sorry, it's a consultation draft. Um, if we are elected to government, we'll start again because I'm, I'm, uh, I've listened to uh, um, advice from this community around and from lawyers around the way that that current bill is drafted and I'm confident that it actually won't ban conversion practices and in actual fact it could make things worse um, and it could in, in actual fact increase um, the prevalence of conversion practices in Tasmania. So we would scrap that bill and start again. Um, we would also um, continue on the work that's already happening across the state service with um, the LGBTIQA plus framework and action plan. And we would want to see that work, um, that those um, groups that feed into that work to look at things like an inclusion act, as well as a standalone medical clinic, which we've given in principle support to as well. We want to see funded from within government. Um, we have committed to extra funding for working it out in addition to their existing base funding, another $95,000 in recurrent and indexed funding going forward. And another election commitment that we've made is to provide peak body funding for Equality Tasmania, which I think is, um, personally, I feel like that's a really significant recognition of the work that Equality Tasmania has been doing for decades and everyone on this call would Remember that while that might be a relatively new name, in fact, it's an organisation that started decades ago, uh, went through several different names, most recently the um, Gay and Lesbian Rights Group, and now Equality Tas. So the work that has been done over decades um, by Rodney and others involved, I think, uh, has been um, the driving force of much of the policy change that has happened in Tasmania. Um, one minute. Thanks, Rodney. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and uh, however, the organisation hasn't been recognised formally as a peak body for the LGBTIQA plus community. And so we've committed to funding them as a peak body um, with a recurrent funding contract of $300,000 a year of indexed funding. We've also committed to hate crime legislation, and I can talk about that a bit more because I know I'll run out of time now, but we've committed to creating new offences in the Criminal Code and the Police Offences Act from government, which would allow police to charge offenders with crimes, recognising when those crimes are motivated by hatred. So that would include homophobia, transphobia, as well as race, disability and other protected attributes. So I'll wind up there. I've probably gone over. Sorry, Rodney and Rowan. Uh, that's OK. Um, thanks, Ella. Um, Next, I'll hand over to Nick. Um, uh, just to say five minutes, Nick, about um, yep. the record and about what's on the table. Yeah. Um, uh, your time starts now. No worries. Thanks, Rodney. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here tonight. Um, can I firstly apologise on behalf of Joe Palmer, who's now the Community Services and Development Minister, who couldn't make this forum tonight. Um, but it was my pleasure to step in um, and represent the government 
um, to make sure that we had all three parties represented at this forum, because I think it's incredibly important that you hear from all of us uh, before the election. Uh, in saying that, I am going to put my hand up and say that I'm not as familiar with all of the election commitments that have been made in this space as I would have been if it was still my portfolio. Um, anybody who understands our system would know that I've got a tough enough job trying to keep across the four portfolios that I've got during an election campaign. But um, in my previous role as Community Services and Development Minister, I was incredibly proud of the support that the government was able to provide to the LGBTIQIA uh, community. Um, we were the first government to provide funding to Equality Tasmania and working it out for policy development. Uh, I know that that was an area that uh, both Lynn and Rodney came to us and said that they were basically doing off the side of their desk um, as a gesture of goodwill towards the government. We had government departments going to both organisations, asking for their assistance in terms of drafting legislation and policy that um, Rodney, Lynn and others were doing um, basically pro bono. So it was a really important commitment, I thought, to, um, to provide that first lot of funding to both organisations for that policy development work. Um, a re-elected Liberal government is going to continue its support um, through a new framework for framework and action plan for the LGBTIQI, LGBTIQA plus community, underpinned by a $500,000 investment into agreed services and programs. Um, those programs and services will be determined by the whole of government working group, which we established as a government as well. Um, which I was proud to co-chair as Community uh, Services and Development Minister. Um, but that working group, along with Equality Tasmania and working it out, will make the decisions on the priorities for that particular piece of government funding going forward. Um, we've obviously tabled the draft um, bill for consultation on conversion practices. Like Ella said, I know that there are concerns within the community about that draft bill. Um, we are committed to working with the community through um, those concerns as well. Um, Stuart, look, I'm here in good faith, mate. I, I don't appreciate you shaking your head while I'm trying to make my statement. Um, I'm, I'm not shaking I'm, my head, Nick. I'm sorry. Yeah. It, um, so we will continue to work with the community through that piece of draft legislation Um and hopefully rectify the concerns that they've got as well um, to make sure that we've got a bill that's fit for purpose because we are committed to the banning of conversion practices in Tasmania. Um, in terms of our other policy positions, I'm more than happy to take questions throughout the night, um, but please uh, take it from me uh, as a member of the Rockcliffe Liberal Government that we're committed to working uh, with the community on uh, Tasmania that, that, um, that treats everybody with respect and allows people um, to live their lives free of prejudice as well. Thank, thanks, Nick. You finished two minutes early. Uh, mm -hmm. Nothing extra to add? No, mate. Okay. Well, uh, we've got, um, I understand there's four uh, independent candidates online now. Um, Sue, who's there, and Christy, and Tamar, who's there. I think I've said that wrong. Sorry, Tamar. Tamar. <laughs> Tamar. <laughs> and uh, Martine Delaney, I think, is, has also joined us. Um, I spoke earlier today to Martine about her time frame. She said it was quite tricky. Uh, Martine, do you, if you're there, do you still have to uh, be somewhere else at six? Is she there, Rowan? Can you hear me now? Oh, uh, yes. Do you, That's the you, Captain Rodney. Yeah. Have you got time, time constraints, Martin? Just, just a, well, I'm actually at another gathering now, which um, I had promised I would be at, which, yeah, despite discussions of, and I'm sorry if it sounds terribly political, but despite discussions of consultation and working with community, it's a case of hundreds of people who cannot understand why the parkland's being given away to a billion-dollar AFL league. Um, well, so, you've, yeah. got the, you've got the mic, so would you like to give us two minutes about um, your candidacy? Uh, but, look, my candidacy, candidacy is not around the issue of, um, of, of queer issues, LGBTQIQA plus issues. Um, there are a number of things which you, Equality has raised in the 
in the survey that I completed um, that are issues we need to deal with, the conversion bill that um, the Rockcliffe government put up. I'm pretty sure they actually outsourced the writing of that to the Australian Christian lobby. Um, and if, yeah, when I'm in Parliament, not if, but when I'm in Parliament, I'll be assisting whoever else wants to get involved to rip that up and let's start again. Uh, because I, I find, I don't know, I'm not quite sure what Mr. Rockcliffe and friends were attempting with that one. Um, for me, though, there is an underlying thing that um, we are living in a time when trans and gender diverse people in particular are under all sorts of threats here and overseas. Um, there are attempts to A, limit our involvement as adults if we've been through a puberty associated with our sex as assigned at birth, but at the same time, there are plenty of people, including former senators in this state, who have been pushing to ensure that um, young people are not able to access any form of intervention that will ensure that they don't go through that puberty. So it's almost like there is a desire to, to wish trans and gender diverse people out of existence somehow. Um, and I think in that setting, um, getting a trans MP into parliament would in fact be a pretty huge message of inclusion to just about every um, TGD person on the, on the planet, and particularly here in Australia and here in Tasmania. Um, and I don't know, I'm struggling a bit. I, I did say I would call in and try and participate in this, but there are hundreds of people here getting quite vocal at the moment. So I maybe yeah. won't. I don't know. Yeah, people can make their own decisions. I, as Rodney, could probably tell you if he wasn't being unbiased. I'm, I was a founding member of the Australian Marriage Equality Group, which led marriage equality. I was by Rodney's side in about 2004 and five in Canberra being threatened by the ALP for having the temerity to turn up in Canberra talking about marriage rights. Um, was one of a very small group of people who, um, very small group of people who spent a couple of days after four years of, four years of lobbying, spent a couple of days in Kevin Rudd's back room, back office, um, organizing what led to the, the rewriting of regulations around trans and gender diverse passport access to to safer passports. Yeah, I'm running out of time. Yeah, I think you're out of time, sorry. Okay, okay. And then, yeah, 15 years on, on birth certificates. I'll leave you to it. I do need to go and be at this other thing I'm supposed to be at. Have fun there, people. Bye. Thanks for joining. See you. Um, see you later. Um, uh, sticking to alphabetical order, I guess that means that uh, um, Tamara, are you st if you're still there, um, can you say just a couple of minutes about um, LGBTIQA plus issues for your candidacy in Franklin, I think, isn't it? Yes, hello, thank you, Rodney. Um, I also would like to acknowledge the Palawa people of Lutruwita and acknowledge that these lands were never ceded. Um, I think uh, it's important to introduce myself. So yes, my name is Tamar Cordova and I am running as an independent in Franklin. Um, I stand on values-driven leadership and I think that it's important that we have a common sense approach to issues of inclusion and sustainability and also accountability. I'd also like to acknowledge that I'm in a room full of, of great women who uh, whose leadership I really respect. And um, I'm pretty honored to be able to be calling, uh, calling these women my peers. So thank you all for the amazing work you've done in this space and in other really important spaces as well. Uh, my lecture and promise has been to really listen to community. As a woman with lived experience of disability, I know how important it is to listen to those lived experience perspectives from within community. So in 2021, I worked with Rodney on defending the Anti-Discrimination Act, Section 17. And that was a really important place to, to have a voice and to make sure that community voices were represented. 
From then, I joined a prejudice-related crime working group, and I've been mentoring with that group for the last couple of years. And I think uh, everyone in the room here knows how important it is that we work collaboratively to address issues of prejudice and that we work not only at the level of justice reform, but we also work at the level of community in order to have safe, inclusive spaces across education, across healthcare. These things, these things aren't, or they shouldn't be in 2024, things that are up for debate. They should be absolutes. And even though we don't have a Human Rights Act here in Tasmania, it is important that our human rights are protected and that our attributes of diversity are respected and acknowledged. And so I have posted my answers and I do absolutely support Equality Tasmania's election promises, or, sorry, election uh, election requests. And yes, I have promised my support for those because at a really deep level, I believe that that support isn't just about my candidacy here, but that support is about being a real true ally to diversity. And I mean that in all senses of the word. Uh, I'm probably getting pretty close to my two minutes. So thanks for thanks everyone for being here and thanks for having me here. And if anyone's interested in any of the prejudice related crime working group, I think that's that's um, a really important, still active and growing segment of of the work that's going on towards justice reform. Thank you. Thanks, Tamar. Um, Sue. Uh, Thank you. Do you want to talk for um, two a couple minutes? Of minutes? Yes. Okay. Well, first of all, I'd like to say things we're all being very kind and respectful that we should acknowledge that um, Nick has gamely came on, come on to this group with us. And my experience is that Nick is a really caring and kind man. And even though he belongs to the Liberals, um, I just like to acknowledge him as a very decent human being. Having listened to the very eloquent speeches of Rosalie and Ella, I wonder if I'm not half Labor, half Green. Um, I totally agree with all of the concepts they've raised and uh, I, I know I will stand by them for all of those issues. I certainly want to see this conversion, um, con banning conversion practices enacted as best gold standard law. So I won't be standing by and seeing that being watered down. Um, I remember some time back Martine Delaney saying to me that if I supported the gender affirmation laws that that would be my defining moment. <laughs> well, it was nearly my near-death experience, I can tell you, but it is something that I will be very proud of because we were able to work with some very caring and kind people to make sure that something that was very wrong in our society was amended. So, um I'm glad, and I know that the Liberals did pick that up as policy afterwards. Um, I, as a Lord Mayor, I remember getting, I kept changing so that we got the biggest rainbow flag we could find. I think we had to have it custom made or something, but we, we flew that from one of the council buildings as high as possible with Rodney there. And it was huge and massive. Whenever I visited Will Hodgman, I'd say, isn't that beautiful? Because it would be flying right outside his office. And uh, one of my happiest days was seeing that law changed um, in Australia. Also, um, the Hobart City Council were big supporters and we had many festivals around marriage equality and LGBTIQA rights. And um, I too support a Human Rights Act. I think that's absolutely, we're at a critical stage of this state's development and we've just got to have one to protect all the rights of everyone standing. A lot of people say, why the hell are you doing this again? And it's because of those little moments when you can actually change someone's life uh, just by, you know, something like banning hate uh, or bringing in hate laws and things like that. So. I'm all for equality, all for decency and all for making sure that we don't have any practices in Tasmania that make someone feel lesser than the rest of us. So if elected, I would be I'm very happy and very proud to work with any party that's going to do the right thing by our fellow human beings. Thanks, Sue. Perfect timing. Um, and that just leaves Christy. Thank you very much everyone and it's a pleasure to be here tonight. Um, I also too just want to acknowledge that um, there are some amazing people here uh, joining the, the 
forum tonight and, and their work that they've done uh, historically as well. From my perspective as an independent and, and right throughout my life and my involvement in community, I come from a place of inclusion, love, respect and dignity. And that's how I assess all the issues that are before me and about how can we enhance that in Tasmania and make our place the best place to live in that regards. And it fills my heart with absolute joy and pleasure that we have so much common ground um, on the forum tonight about this, but, but across our community and it crosses party lines and I think that this is um, values that are exclusive to any one party and, and or independent. There's something that we should hold intrinsically to ourselves. But there are some dark forces that are coming out and particularly um, during this campaign and that worries me greatly. So it's more important now than ever um, that when you're casting your vote, you think about um, those candidates, both individually and across the parties, uh, that really are going to commit to, as I say, inclusion, respect, dignity and love uh, in what they do. I've been to a number of candidate forums and I know I think I've seen uh, all the candidates uh, here just about at those forums and there is a, a dark side coming out and that's a real concern. As an independent member for Clark, I was really proud to sponsor and work with Equality Tasmania and Rodney to sponsor the banning conversion practices petition. That was a huge e-petition. I'm so proud. I think it was 6,011 people signed that petition uh, that was tabled in Parliament. And I was really proud to be the sponsor of that and be the voice of inclusion uh, on your behalf in the Parliament. Um, I asked a number of questions about the progress of this bill because I know we've been waiting for a very long time and it's a real disappointment to the LGBTQIA plus community that it was only at the 11th hour we saw a release of a draft consultation paper and bill um, which falls far short of what the TLRI, TLRI recommendations are. And it's a real disappointment there. We've got so much work clearly to do uh, around convincing some members of the community that conversion practices aren't therapeutic, that they cause enormous harm and that they should be banned in total. Um, there is a, a dark force, as I say, gathering around that and trying to get that water down. And I am really concerned and I think we need to unite on that particular front. I've responded to all of Equality Tasmania's questions and forum uh, uh, policy requests and support them all. Um, in particular, I want to see progress desperately on the intersex law reform that is long overdue, just like the conversion ban practices. Uh, the hate crime legislation needs to be put through on a number of fronts because there are aggravating factors that just aren't taken into consideration uh, enough. And we are seeing, unfortunately, as I say, those dark forces in our community starting to re-emerge. Um, I'm also very keen to see a, a redress scheme for those who have had an historical criminal record. And, and I know, Rodney, that we were talking about that just before the election and was called about what can we do to try and make sure that that issue progresses. And unfortunately, as a result of the election, those things have been put on hold. But that doesn't mean that though, that need is in the community any less. Um, and we need to act quite quickly on that particular front. Um, again, I'm very concerned about a move in the community to see a watering down of um, laws in respect to gender recognition and also around the anti-discrimination and I'm, I'm sure the candidates have received one minute thank you Rodney have received um, you know, quite concerning literature and, and survey particularly from um, the ACL um, schools and, and the like wanting to see significant changes I think that would reduce the effectiveness of our anti-discrimination act um, in particular and also put um, young Tasmanians I think at risk so I'm really keen to keep working with the LGBTIQ plus community to, to strengthen those laws and to make sure they are strong and they're respectful and, again, they um, come from a place of inclusion. Just equally, we also need those Human Rights Act uh, and adequate funding and, and health services for the community as well. So I'll probably leave it there because I think I've probably run out my two minutes, but I'm really pleased to be here and I'm really hopeful that whatever shape the Parliament might be uh, come 23rd of March, that we can all work together um, from that place of inclusion and love. Thanks, Christy. Um, and thanks, everyone, for those... Um snappy and really informative contributions. I'm um, very much appreciated. So we'll go to questions now. Um, I might hand over to Rowan because Rowan's um, looking at chat, got that in front of him. Um, I'm not so good at this stuff, but he's a teacher. He knows exactly how to do it. <laughs> yeah, I've got someone threatening me that they've got a question, but they just haven't sent it through yet. I shouldn't say threatening, but they're threatening that they've got a question. Ah, oh, excellent. Um, I've got it here. There is no direction to this, so I might just throw it to the group and you can just pop your hand up. First one, put your hand up, a bit like a buzzer. Uh, it's been almost four years since the TLRI report was released on banning non-consensual surgeries. Uh, 
What does a commitment to the TLRI report on banning non-consensual surgeries on people with innate sex differences and historical future redress look like in practical terms? That is timeline resourcing to undertake this legislative reform, consultation and or parliamentary committee to investigate. It's taken three years for there to be an acknowledgement that these types of surgeries are occurring in this state and some members of the community have met with several of the incumbent candidates and two premiers and nothing has happened to date. Would anyone like to take that? I'm happy to speak to that and I can say, you know, the Greens support legislation in this area and it is about, um, you know, making a concerted decision to prioritise this legislation and I I think it's I think it's incredibly important. Um, obviously, uh, if we were in a balance of power, it would be on the list of many things that we'd be fighting um, to have addressed by um, by the government. But um, the, I mean, I suppose no, there's no there's no battle and here. There is also like this critical issue about um, banning cons conversion practices and um, they're both critical issues. So um, I'm a firm believer in governments being able to do multiple things at the same time. Let's face it, there's a lot of resources that um, the uh, Attorney General has and they should be focused on these issues at first and foremost and a lot of resources over the last um, four years, three years of this government have not been focused on the priority issues in, from our point of view. So we would be focused on, you know, calling on the next government to declare what its legislative agenda was and um, pushing to have it prioritised in that, in that legislative agenda. I think it does have to have um, a very active and concerted campaign from the community as well with um, sort of a specific strategy for um, what the issues are that want to be in the legislation and how to go about it. And, and we're happy to work uh, with the community to talk about that. Just firstly, Rodney, on that, I am, I am one of the incumbent members of parliament that the question that the person who asked the question was talking about having met with advocates in this area. Um, I can only apologise. It's one of the areas that, um, that we haven't acted on quickly enough. Um, I know that the Department of Health is working on, on a review of the TLRI recommendations, but I also recognise the three-year time frame that the person who asked the question was asking about as well. Um, it's some, something that needs to be looked at very, very quickly as well. I hoped, it, like Rosalie, that it was going to be dealt with at the same time as the conversion therapy issue because I think pretty sure the TLRI report was on both issues at once. So, um, yeah we need a more concerted effort to come to a conclusion on that issue. Thanks, Nick. Um, uh, I'll just back that in a little as well, Rodney. Just, just our... before, Ella, just before, uh, I think Christy's having trouble unmuting. I don't know if you can fix that, Rowan. Uh, Christy seems to have gone. Yeah, I think it might be a connection issue. I think she's, she's trying to get back in. So if you could check yeah. that. Sorry, Ella, go ahead. No, that's okay. Um, just it's I've covered it in our question answers to the um equality TAD survey as well, but it is a priority for Labor. I think that the um work, a lot of the work has been done for the Parliament by the Law Reform Institute, and um we can learn a lot as well from other jurisdictions around that medical and criminal law um reform that is needed to uh to effectively deal with um unnecessary surgeries on intersex and people with inter, um, variations of sex characteristics. So it will be a priority for us. Um, I'm a big fan of parliamentary committees. That was in the question. Um, on this one, you know, I wouldn't be opposed to the idea of one, but I also feel like a lot of that work has already been done for us and it would and there has already been a significant time delay. So I think it would um, definitely be something that it's a matter of uh, incoming government prioritising that law reform. And I agree as well around needing to prioritise a ban on conversion practices, absolutely. So it would be a early priority for an incoming Labor government if I was the one in the Attorney General's chair, which would be nice. Thanks, Ella. Um, Nick and Rosalie. Does anyone else want to make a contribution? I think Christy did. Um, I think she's coming back into the chat. But anyone else? Tamar? 
Thanks. Yeah, look, I'd just like to say that I'm pretty excited for the possibility of some sort of a coalition in government and really hearing the diverse perspectives from community and obviously lived experience of of all people. I think that a coalition would be really well placed to be able to have those just diverse perspectives represented. Thanks. Thanks. Um, so can we move on to the next question? Yeah, we'll just jump ahead of you, Stephen. Sorry, because there's someone sent me a direct question and then you can go next. Um, I would like to know how candidates and their parties, if applicable, plan to respond to an increasingly transphobic culture that goes beyond merely legislating hate speech, including pervasive media harms with incorrect and alarmist reporting in some outlets, and how the plan to demonstrate their commitment to this very vulnerable population, which also includes agender folks, this response would demand a specific commitment to trans human rights, not just LGBTIQA plus inclusivity slash diversity protections, if you could expand on that. I'll open it to the floor. Who'd like to jump in? Um, I guess I can go. Um, okay. Yeah, uh, having experience firsthand uh, when I was questioning and closeted and then um, coming out as trans and then dealing with just the level of vitriol that is in the media, which has only increased since then. Um, completely aware of the level of harm that causes to mental health. Uh, and yeah, it's it's not just down to legislation, it's also about education, it's about what we're doing to actually work with the community, um, to actually go out and demonstrate that we are just regular people, there's no, there's no demon, there's no bogeyman. And um, yeah, as you indicated, pretty much leading in the question there, um, looking at what is responsible reporting and what is actually reporting that is having a disproportionate impact on any group. Um, and I understand and sympathise because I know that when people say we support LGBT people, they'll often follow that up with something deeply transphobic. So, yeah, it is important to highlight that. Um, I think at the same time, it's going to be important to... Um, bring forward a broader suite of measures because we've got a lot of issues with racism, a lot of issues with ableism that also um, would benefit from similar legislation. Any other thoughts? Sure. I think um, Jade has just expressed it very, very well. I mean, at the moment, I think we're living in this world of hate and it doesn't matter, you know, what your background is or like a, this uh, election period is no better than any other I've been through. You know, you're a fat slug, a slag, I mean, you're all sorts of things. I can see your wrinkles, you use Botox, all this rubbish. And it's all hateful and mean and spiteful and a lot of sexual overtones. So I, I think we have to calm the whole community down on lots of issues. We need to be more loving and accepting of each other. I don't know how we um, come back from this brink that we're on at the moment. Um, that is a world full of pain and anger, and we're seeing it with our youth coming out in the youth as well. And, you know, we took such a long time to come to terms with LGBTIQ issue, AQ issues. Um, and to get to marriage equality and all of these things. But I think we can't allow that distance to continue. We've got to do everything that we're going to do at a lot faster rate because otherwise we're not going to calm down this, this hatred, which is no good for anybody. And I think we all suffer and we're all the lesser. And I'm very ashamed of some of the things I've heard in recent weeks about the multicultural issues and um, transgender and particularly from some of the candidates, which I think is just appalling and I've been to some of the church um, rallies where they've had candidates there and it's you know it's quite uh, sickening to hear some of the language that's used so um, I think somehow rather we have to bring back the peace movement and love for all but I'm not certain how we do that we just have to hold hands and get through this. Thanks Sue. Um, anyone else want to contribute on this issue of um, um supporting trans people and protecting trans rights that are under attack? Only just to quickly say, Rod, you know, I think others have, have mentioned this as well, that we can't, we don't need to make sure we don't fall into the trap of thinking that legislation is going to be the cure all to all of this as well, that we've all got a responsibility as community leaders when we hear derogatory things said 
or we see behaviour that needs to be called out, that we actually take the responsibility on ourselves to call it out as members, as community leaders, uh, because that's the only way that we're going to change the culture going forward. Um, and I've been involved in public life, if that's what you want to call it, for the last 13 years, um, and it's getting worse. Um, I think social media has got a lot to do with that as well because it allows people to say things about other people People directly to them that they wouldn't say to them in the street. Having said that, I don't have the lived experience that others on this call have got as well. And I understand that there are plenty of people who do have to deal with physical confrontation um, every day as well. Um, and so, like I said, when when you see that behaviour, when you hear that behaviour, we've got a responsibility to call it out. Um, and I was, like Sue said, I was at the MCOT function at Government House last Thursday night and was pretty dismayed, I've got to say, by some of the conversations that went on at that as well about um, pretty aggressive racism uh, that's infiltrated parts of the community as well. Um, so we've got we've got a massive job to do and it doesn't just happen in the four walls of parliament either. It's got to happen outside of that as well. Thanks, Nick. Um, I think, Tamar, you had a comment and uh, I'm sorry to go on about Christy. Is she back in? She sent me a message saying she wanted to say something. I'm I think. back in, yes. Sorry. I'm back in, sorry, but I can't put my hand up, so I just have to jump in. Sorry, Rodney, when you're free. Uh, sorry, okay, go for it. Well, uh, Tamara and then Christy. Um, thank you. Um, look, I think accountability is really important and media accountability is an issue of concern across several, across, across several um, poor reporting um, what we've what we've suggested is that we find we find mechanisms and ensure that we offer to community mechanisms for reporting of antisocial behaviour. And so, through Equal Opportunity Tasmania, we've been encouraging people to put those reports in. They can be anonymous reports, but that way we can start a process of gathering data. And from gathering data, data is a really useful way to to press for change. Um, I think the other thing that has that I've found to be really important is um, a sense of collaboration. So yes, working with allies, but across across all our communities really coming together and that's one of the things with the the prejudice related crime working group is that we're across interfaith communities we're across disability lbgtqia plus um there's been some really important multicultural involvement there's been there's been this really really big cohesion and part of that is building cohesion but then the other part is really making sure that we're letting all diverse, all diversity know that there are supports and where there aren't supports, building those supports for community in order that antisocial issues, antisocial behaviours don't fall on to individual community members or individuals and then their communities only to support that we can start building, building solutions from there. I think uh, we all know that information is power and that language is really important. And so when we all get together, then we can start to share language and we can start to learn the language that is respectful and we can start to use and practice that language and to set that example. Um, and I think that that's, that that's really, that that's really helpful is, is making sure that we we're aware of those power disparities that come with lack of information, but also those, those challenges where we're not all using the same respectful language. Thanks Tamara. Christy, can you turn off mute now? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Sorry about the, the technical difficulties there. My bandwidth is playing up, unfortunately. Um, but just picking up on what Tamar was talking about there, I think one of the most important things we can do is, is to really change the conversation around language that we use. Um, and I, I've noticed it, you know, changing over time that the derogatory kind of language has just slipped back into our, our unfortunately common dialogue. Um, and it's important that as leaders, um, and I think as candidates too, we challenge um, that in terms of the discourse that we're having at the moment. I, I really am disturbed at the kind of language that we see used, um, you know, particularly on, I've been to the candidate forums. I think um, Sue and Ellie might have been there um, last week at the one that we had at Wellspring Anglican Church where people um, from the LGBTQIA plus community were talked about as having struggles and mental health issues. Um, and it needed to be called out, um, you know, that, that 
people in the community aren't broken. They don't need fixing. Um, they are full and complete and wonderful human beings just as they are. And so we need to challenge that kind of language. And I think it's really important that um, from a political party perspective that they're really careful about those candidates that they choose to represent them um, and to ask the public to vote for that are that use you know respectful language in, in whatever discourse and, and forum we are in so in terms of how do we support trans people through this really difficult time and and as i said i think it's a very difficult time there's some dark forces gathering it's about um as leaders putting your hand out and saying look that's not okay um that's not respectful language that's not the language that we use uh and to really change dialogue around that thanks christy uh Stuart, your hands up. Did you want to make a comment on this issue or another one? I'll just be brief because I agree with what a lot of um, <clears throat> what Christy just said there. It, it comes down to um, leadership. Um, um, for those who don't know, I'm a Rainbow Labor candidate, so I'm one of the community. I'm not trans, um, but I've been with my partner for eight years, um, and I know what it's like um, whilst running in Clark. I did grow up on the northwest, so I come from regional Tasmania. Um, and I know what it's like. Um, I went to school from grade seven to grade 12 without being called certain slurs every single day. Um, and it took me um, 20 to the age of 25 to actually come out because it was um, not a good experience um, and set me back a long way. So it comes down to leadership and calling things out. It is coming down to language. Um, I'm proud of the work I've done within the Labor Party as the founding member of Rain by Labor to pursue not only policy, but changing the, um, the culture and also getting candidates on the ticket to have a good chance of being elected to the parliament because representation does matter. Um, you know, I'm not running just because I'm a Rainbow Labor candidate. I care about many issues, but I think it does set a good um, example to the community that you can achieve anything um, and don't let anyone who set you back or put you in a box and say you can't. Um, you can do it. Um, and I just wanted to say if I do get there, I will be doing whatever I can to be calling out hateful language I'm not trans, but our trans brothers and sisters are facing um, enormous attacks at the moment that is quite um, um, frightening. Um, and if we're successful being there, I want to give you an assurance that I'll also stand up and fight, but also do what I can to change the culture uh, and language. I don't know what we do about social media, but I agree with what Sue said. It is uh, changed um, the whole nature of debate. And Nick's absolutely right. I've come across people during this campaign that have put things on my Facebook and have actually come across them in person and then they go and cower and hire when you're face to face to them. I don't know how you solve that, but as an MP and if elected as um, uh, we all become leaders then that I'll just stand up and fight and, and, and push back every time there's an attempt, not only to wind back things or to attack our community, um, but also around language as well and how we communicate. Thanks, Stuart. Um... Jay, did you have another few words to say on this issue? Yeah, sorry, I know I've already gone, so I'll be quick. Um, I just wanted to say that if it comes to uh, hearing of hate and needing to call it out, then that's kind of like already several steps too late. Um, so like important way back before it gets to that stage is modelling positive language, modelling support, modelling care, um, but then also looking at the everyday microaggressions um, like, for instance, with regards to um, transphobia that often isn't recognised as transphobia, pe people laughing at a male comedian dressing up as a woman, like those kinds of small things that just fly under the radar that kind of contribute to a broader culture. And obviously the same applies to um, pretty much every marginalisation. Thanks. Thanks, Jade. Um, thanks for those fantastic contributions on that issue. Uh, we should move on because there's a bunch more questions. Who's next, Rowan? Uh, Stephen's up next. Stephen, sorry you've had your hand up. Lucky it's not your physical hand, otherwise you'd have no blood in it, but you're ready to go. Uh, thank you. Uh, can you hear me okay? Great. Um, well, firstly, thanks very much for everyone taking the time to come and uh, speak to us tonight and outline your, your positions. Um, Ella and Rosalie, uh, thank you for taking the time in the past to listen to some of the concerns that um, we've had at home and in the experience that we had um, subject to homophobic hatred. Um, and, and Nick, thank you for contributing to saying, you know, we, we need to call it out. Um, but I guess what I'd, I'd like to ask, I'd outline a couple of things, but calling it out, if you're the subject of that hatred, a hatred is directed to you and you're at home alone and you have no one to call but the police and the police 
if their hands are tied and they can't do anything without a restraint order and then you go and get a restraint order and they still can't do anything and then you need 50 plus breaches of restraint order which requires proof beyond reasonable doubt um, that a person is guilty of that hatred to go anywhere near close to um, bringing charges under section 192 of the criminal code for stalking and bullying we've got a we've got legislation there that's not working and so we definitely immediately need, I think, community members, because it's not, it, it's spread across the state, it's in little pockets in different areas. Most Australians, most Tasmanians would be mortified and horrified and probably disbelieving of, of some of the things that go on, because in 2024, no one would expect anything like that. And the behaviour that we were subjected to, like, I didn't expect at all, ever in my lifetime. But when I discovered that the people that you rightly, I, I thought, when you, you call the police if you're in trouble like that, and to discover that they can't do anything and they'll tell you they can't do anything, I think it, it, it really does highlight the issue that, yes, we do need legislation, we do need strong legislation, and we do need, yes, we can call it out, but if no one's there to call it out, and if you're a vulnerable person in the community, then you need the police to act. And they're, they're not empowered to act. That leaves a whole lot of people very, very vulnerable for a very long time and creates a whole lot of hurt and damage and affects so many lives. And that ripples through so many other people's lives. Um, we, we need a lot urgently. And it doesn't need to be massive changes but we need to make really urgent changes so that they when you call it out there's someone to call and they can do something thanks Stephen. um and thanks for that, that, the trauma that you've gone through there um ella sorry i can't work out how to raise my hand on the thing i think i'd know that after four years of zoom <laughs> Um, thank you, Stephen, for sharing your story. It's very um, meaningful and generous of you, you to do that. Um, and my answer goes a little bit to the last question as well around the importance of there being law reform, but recognising that laws are simply words on paper. They don't change culture and they don't change behaviour in the community. Um, that said, we are committed to doing the work on both sides of that. So first of all, we're committed to legislation that would allow police to charge somebody with an offence, um, recognising that that offending, you know, be it assault, property damage, whatever it may be, um, recognising in the charge that that offending was motivated by hatred. So that would will include basically the protected attributes in the Anti-Discrimination Act, including sexuality, gender and gender identity and sexual orientation, as well as race and disability and others as well. I know that that will be challenging because it's going to come down to as well the police saying, well, how did, how did we know? So to give the example of some race-related violence that we've been exposed to in the community recently, there's been, it's pretty clear from particular um, shop owners in the Glenorchy municipality that the assaults that have happened on their staff and their shop are racially motivated. Um, they've got CCTV footage, you know, and evidence that these young people are motivated by racial hatred. So it is possible to actually demonstrate that, but the police need the tools to be able to um, respond and lay charges that recognise the motivations of those offences. They can't do that at the moment. So particularly when it comes to the current campaign around that EOT and MRC and MCOD are running around getting people to report race-related crime, to the police, often people do that and then the police can't take the report because they they don't have a facility to do that because there isn't a crime called assault or property damage based, motivated by racial hatred. So we're committed to um, introducing those new offences so that police can actually recognise, particularly when it comes to homophobia and transphobia, it's often very clear that that's the, that's the motivation behind the criminal offending um, because of the way people speak and the things that they are saying. So we want to equip the police with the tools they need in terms of the legislation, but we also want there to be training for police. And we would be prioritising that so that it's understood well across the police force, but on the uh, broader community, in the broader community as well, that that kind of offending is not acceptable and it's not welcome in Tasmania. 
Um, so it's a kind of whole, whole system kind of change that is needed. The words on paper are important in terms of the laws, but we want to see training for police and cultural awareness training across the community to make sure that people understand that kind of offending needs to stop and it's not acceptable. It's a bit of a rambling answer, but that's where my thinking is on those new offences that we want to introduce. Just, uh, uh, you go, just very quickly, uh, Rodney, Stephen, um, I'm so sorry that you've been subject to that behaviour. Um, can I just say, when I was talking about the responsibility for calling it out, I was talking about us, not not people who are victims of the crime. And I see you nodding your head, so you recognise that as well. Um, but I also understand that when you're subject to this sort of behaviour and you do um, make the brave choice to call it out, that you expect people in authority to have the tools necessary to actually deal with it um, and make a substantial contribution to fixing the, the issue that you're bringing to them. So Ella is absolutely right. Um, I know I'm advised that the Sentencing Advisory Council are actually looking um, at some issues around this at the minute in terms of whether um, they can make some changes to add uh, that allows for the aggravated sentencing where, where it's proven that a crime is motivated by the issues that you're talking about. But Ella's right as well that before it gets to the sentencing stage, the police have to have the tools available at their um, at their disposal or at their use uh, to bring these people to account and to get them into the court system to be dealt with as well. Thank you. Rosie? Stephen, thank you for sharing, and that's a horrifying story. And um, you know, I I feel I feel um, I feel really sickened by what's happened in my local community to to you and and the um, some other women. And what it says to me is there needs to be in addition to the things that Ella has talked about and Nick and we're on a unity ticket on wanting to see that legislation. There has to be something else as well. There've got to be other. Um, there's got to be a safe place for people to go and an obvious place for people to go to report that sort of abuse. And it's a big step going to the police. And most people don't want to go there first, um, if at all. They don't ever want to go to the police if they can avoid it, let's face it. Um, it's just like not an easy step to make. And as there is with family violence, there is identified places for people to talk to. There needs to be an identified place in every community in Tasmania, a safe place for people to talk about those sorts of, um, uh, that sort of abuse. And I know, um, you know, councils have got a role here because some of the, uh, some of this abuse is initially reported as kind of a neighbourhood dispute. And there is, um, then we need to have LEGAT, the Local Government Association of Tasmania, having a role with um, with the police and with appropriately changed legislation, with working it out and with with other bodies to have a, um, a systematic response across Tasmania in different regions. We can't just do it like bit by bit, place by place, responding to, you know, different communities. Uh, so I think there needs to be a, a cultural conversation that happens about the difference between neighbourhood dispute and, you know, um, hate hate crimes, um, hate, hate abuse, and how councils can support people um, and how they can take a leadership role in standing for an inclusive community, which is what, you know, you'd hope and expect all councils in Tasmania would want to be doing. So I think Legat can play a leadership role because a lot of this stuff is happening in a very, very localised space, but I totally support the fact we need the legislation and we also need to really have a good look at who the first contact points in Tasmania police are for these things. We need to have training for all police officers, but recognising there's a lot of police officers in Tasmania and we can't wait for everybody to change, you know, what for some people are entrenched and, let's face it, um, you know, disrespectful values some police officers have, just like across our community for LGBTIQA plus people. We can't wait uh, for that to be rolled out to everyone to find safe police that people can report to when abuse happens. So we need to have, and there is, I understand, I mean, we've already talked about this as, as sort of a unit in the police that's meant to be working on this, but I, I don't know how people experience that and whether it's working and what the problems are.
but I really think we need to do a deep dive into the case studies of what's happening, you know, what happened to you and what's happening to other people and work out where the problems are and what needs to be fixed and work backwards from that to find the solutions and put the resourcing into it. Thanks, Rosalie. Um, I'll jump in there, Rodney, if that's possible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. just wanted to add um, to everyone else's voices there and their support. And Stephen, I'm, I thank you for sharing um, your experiences tonight, and I'm so sorry that that's happened to you. Just on adding on to Rosalie's point there about the importance of training um, our police officers. Um, not only do they need the right tools in order to respond, but also it's incredibly disappointing, I think, that our police officers aren't trained in trauma reform practices, so that when they're actually responding to um, victims of crime, that they're, they're not uh, don't have the tools necessarily, not only legislatively, but also um, interpersonally to be able to recognise the impact of this offending on the victim uh, and to be able to respond in a trauma-informed way too. So I would also like to not only see our police officers have that toolkit in terms of the, the legislation and the ability to respond uh, quite quickly and, and, and forcefully in that way in terms of how they stop that offending, but they also need to be able to acknowledge uh, the harm that has caused the victim and to be able to respond in a trauma-informed way too. So that's a real gap, um, I think, in our provision of training to our police officers in Tasmania is that they don't have that um, as a core component of their training and that needs to happen. Thanks, Christy. Um, uh, Tamar, just a, I'll come to you in a second. Um, now, Nick uh, just indicated um, has indicated to me that he needs to go in a couple of minutes um, because the meeting was only entered into his diaries an hour. Uh, so um, you have to uh, fly off, Nick. Thanks very much for your for coming along and for your contribution. Much appreciated. Uh, I I'm really sorry, Rodney, but I have to get to another function at seven o'clock, so I just can't stay. Um, but thank you very much for having me. Um, Good luck to all the candidates that are online on Saturday. Um, and if I'm re-elected, I'll see some of you back in Parliament. Thanks, Nick. Um, uh, Tamar. Thanks, Rodney. Look, everything everybody said is absolutely right, right? Trauma-informed, justice reform, law reform, the training of police, how important language is, that sharing of information, culture change. Um, I think we need to embed inclusion in a lot of our governance structures. And we really need to have a lens on diversity. And I think that that comes from lived experience leadership. And so that's the only thing I wanna add on to all of those great those great perspectives is um, is how important from how important lived experience leadership is. It can be very, very challenging when those experiences that you're having as an individual person are really just somebody else's job. And at the end of the day, they go home and you still have to figure out a way to get on with to get to get on with safety and to get on with with life in these systems that aren't always fair or just. And when we go to those people that we think might help us and we find that there actually isn't necessarily justice for us because of an attribute. And so, Stephen, thanks. Thanks for, for telling that story. Um, I have. I have my own stories that I could share, but here is not the place, but I absolutely hear what you're saying and and it isn't right now, it isn't good enough. And um, and I think live, lived experience really helps change that, having forums where we're able to come together with community and, and leadership and really ask for those lenses on diversity and have those things embedded into our governance structures. It's so, so, so important. Thanks. Thanks, Tamar. Um, if there's no more contributions, then uh, Rowan, What's the next question? And and just noting that uh, we've got about 16, 17 minutes left, so uh, so we can get through all the questions if people can keep it keep it brief. Yep. Uh, so current question: We have no residential rehab, alcohol, and drug services in Taz that aren't run by religious organisations. Is anyone able to speak to how this may change for the better in the future? Please, many thanks. And someone has followed up with an NSPs too. Someone might need to elucidate what NSP is. Sorry, I'm a teacher. I don't know all the acronyms that are located out the back of religious organizations, therefore hindering folks who have had negative experiences with faith-based orgs from accessing new injecting equipment. And I will add my own personal anecdote here in receiving gender aff aff affirmative care in Tassie. I had to go through the private system um, and in that uh, system and in a Calvary hospital, I had to pretend I had cancer for five days uh, to receive that care. <laughs> 
So how make a comment on the <laughs> Russian roulette that is the private public sector for uh, any type of healthcare for LGBTIQA plus people in Tasmania. Needle and syringe program. Oh, sorry, Rosa, didn't mean to interrupt you. It's a needle and syringe program, yeah. and I understood that they are available not just at faith-based organisations, but that doesn't. But but it depends which part of Tasmania you're in, obviously, and in some places. I I recognise that it's highly likely that that may be the only place that you can access a safe um, safe injecting equipment and dispose of it safely. Yeah. Um, it, I mentioned before that we don't have uh, it um, safe and inclusive primary care and um, mental health care and um, and um, recovery drug and alcohol recovery services in Tasmania. It's a huge problem, and the parliamentary committee that's been looking into gendered health care has identified it as a huge problem. Uh, it is something that the next government needs to address. It's uh, a question for this community about how best to do that and what sort of services, how, how, what sort of ser what services would look like. Whether it should be um, a centralised service, whether you know which which parts of the state it would sit in, whether it should be services that um, obviously there has to be public services that are uh, that aren't faith based because um, if people don't feel safe there, then it doesn't tick the box, does it? So we would support a community conversation about what those services should look like. It's complicated um, whether you try and expand existing services and make them 100% uh, inclusive. Um, some people think that that's the right approach and uh, other people feel that the only genuine, integral, inclusive space is one that is uh, run by, designed for, um, staffed by, um, LGBTIQA plus um, providers and staff. So that's a conversation to have. But, I mean, I think we're, we've started in a space in Tasmania where there's a recognition, at least from the parliamentary committee and uh, this community, that that's required. And now it's up to us to have the conversations about what they should look like and to push to make them happen. Can I jump in as well, Rodney? Rowan? Um, I just wanted to say that I acknowledge that there's a massive lack of residential rehab uh, for in the AOD sector full stop across Tasmania and there's also no use specific alcohol and drug residential rehab in Tasmania. It's been a massive problem for decades now. So for those young people who can afford to travel to the mainland or whose families can afford for them to travel to the mainland, that's what people are doing and people are also leaving the state to access resi rehab that's not faith-based. I used to work at the alcohol and drug Council, which is the peak body for the alcohol and drug service delivery sector. Um, and I was on the board of TASCARD at that time, as well as an alcohol and drug sector representative. And those problems were um, very present and real then, including access to uh, safe and clean injecting equipment. Although it did take me a good few months in the job to work out the acronym NSP as well. I'll tell the story another time about my my embarrassing conversation with my boss where she kept talking about NSPs and it took me a while to work out that's what it was when I was new to the job um, and then I came to know them intimately so um, there is a, a a problem with there not being enough service delivery in the alcohol and drug sector that isn't based in faith-based organisations not to say that they don't provide good services many of them do but there needs to be a choice for people who want to seek health treatment, including alcohol and drug rehabilitation services outside of a faith-based setting to be able to do exactly that. I don't have the health portfolio, but I know that it's something that Anita Dow, as the Shadow Minister for Health, is also a very strong supporter of the LGBT community and recognises the need for more alcohol and drug rehabilitation services. So this is something that I know she would be happy to have on the agenda if we may be able to form a government. Thanks, Rosalie and Ella. Anyone else want to contribute to this one? No hands up. Uh, Rowan, um, do we have? Oh, sorry. Oh, Tamar's got something that they yeah, want to add. Yeah, sorry. Tamar? Yeah. So it's just the real simple right funding. Um, when we want to, we seem to be able to find funds to do certain things. And um, 
it's really important that funds are found to to support community services, especially where we've seen and identified gaps in services. Thanks. Um, Rodney, I have a closing question. Can I take the floor? That's a good yeah, go for it. You're you're the you're the admin you're the admin. You can do mm. what you want. Oh yeah, true. I'm the boss. Um this was mostly what I wanted to ask Nick, but I'm gonna pose it to everybody else. Uh, Sue mentioned that there is an increased polarization, which is 100% correct. And I think some of the frustrating things I find as a gender diverse person is that politicians often play into that. And I think across all parties, not just some parties in Tasmania, have a diverse perspective on gender diverse people. Um, how do you call people in and call people out in your party or in parliament um, for the independents? How do you handle that? And I think, um, you know, how do you call out the absolute bashing of of trans people for political gain? And what are you doing in your party to stamp it out? And like, you know, Labor Party, you have you had Mark Latham. <laughs> I'm sure there's some people in there that are perhaps not on board. Um, I know the Victorian Greens had some problems with transphobic views in the past, and I know the Labor the Liberal Party also. I'm sure everyone in the room can attest that there are some diverse perspectives in the Liberal Party. So I guess that's my closing question. How are you calling out and calling in people? So you got your hand up. Yeah, um, like I experienced this firsthand as when we were doing the gender affirmation legislation, um, there were good people in the Liberal Party, but there were some very, very gross people and a lot of their supporter base who are a lot older and bigoted is the only way I can describe it. So I think it's up to all of us to vote these people out. Try, I mean, they've got strong support bases. You know, there's a couple of really obvious ones that have um, women um, hate issues. And then there's ones down in the Franklin area that are renowned for this kind of negativity around uh, any form of diversity. So I, it's up to all of us to vote them out, get rid of them and try and change this whole conversation because there are decent people in each and every party. And, you know, I'm, the one thing I'm hopeful for is that this will be a transformational time that will um, have a diverse enough parliament to actually have grown-ups in the room debating things fairly and people who are going to listen and refine legislation as it comes past whereas that hasn't been possible with a majority government. It has been bullied through the parliament largely, and that's the sort of rubbish we have to stamp out because it's no good for any of us. And, you know, I just can't believe some of the things I'm hearing out of a party that I unfortunately was once associated with, but um, I got out for the, the very reasons you're discussing. Thanks, Sue. Um, anyone else got any thoughts on challenging hum challenging transphobia? Yeah, I'll, I'll talk about it from the point of view of the Greens. Um, yes, there is. Um, there has been some um, trans, transphobic views in the Victorian Greens and in Tasmania we were horrified at that, uh, you know, horrified as a party to have people expressing views like that and how we approach these things in Tasmania, I suppose, is how we approach politics is never let... Never let hateful words or hateful values go unchecked once, ever. Address them immediately. So never never let things slide. Um, take them very seriously. Um, demand respect. Uh, and demand respect in the way that we have our own party processes. And so we have been very active in attending to respectful party processes in the last year, and I think it stands us in really good stead to be able to hear any any of those sorts of uh, voices and just make it very clear that this is not this is not a party. We're not that party. But in the parliament, I just want to respond to what you said, Rowan. We all have a responsibility to how we respond to other people, and it is about not letting things go without being said, unsaid, well, uh, you know, un unchallenged. But it's going to be so important and increasingly important that we do that in a way which doesn't devalue um, um, respectful language. And it is a challenge uh, when you're confronted with um, prejudice and bigotry, um, you know, naked 
um, hateful comments, uh, things which are said with the purpose of stoking division in the community. It's, it's very challenging being in in the chamber when people are doing that with the purpose of hurting communities to stoke division. But it is incumbent on us all, and I know Ella and um, Sue and Christy would agree that we we try really hard and we have to try harder to model the values uh, that we expect in others, even in the face of that bigotry and hatred. And it is about showing strength and um, not backing down, but doing it in a way where we don't lose our dignity and uh, respect. Thanks, Rosalie. And I will preface, um, I do not mean that in any pointed direction of any party, really. Um, even Richardson Incorporated, some of my extended family have been known to make comments that are challenging and it's more just within your party community. How do you, and that was a great answer. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Tamar and Jade both had their hands up and I guess, um, Christy, you haven't responded and uh, Ella or Stuart potentially you might want to respond in the next five. So maybe one minute each, uh, Jade and Tamar, or Jade, do you want to go first? Yeah, thank you. So I just wanted to really quickly bounce off that last thing was said about modelling positive behaviour with some really great lived experience from my experience within the Tasmanian Greens. Um, so first time I ran for federal parliament, I was closeted. Um, and unfortunately, there was yeah, there was an attempt to like expose the fact that I was transgender and the Tasmanian Greens absolutely backed me to the hilt unquestioningly. They were incredibly supportive. And so that is that the flip side to calling things out is modeling that really good positive behavior. Thanks, Jed. Um, Stuart, and then Chris. Uh, yeah, thanks, Rowan. Um, well, the Labor Party is a very different party to when Mark Clayson was leading it in 2004. Uh, and I was party secretary of the Labor Party from 2017 to only January this year. So I was an openly queer uh, secretary of the Labor Party. And so I use my position as party secretary to um, uh, set a standard, to, to drive change, um, uh, to also educate. But for me, it's also about organising, <laughs> Rowan. Um, my greatest achievement as a party member was changing the party's platform in 2009 on marriage equality. Now, while some of you might think that was an easy task, at the time it was a very difficult um, thing to do. It was not easy. I remember it very clearly. Our state conference was before the national conference a week beforehand. Kevin Rudd was prime minister. He was dead against marriage equality. He did not want the issue debated at national conference. I had a motion on marriage equality and I worked with Rodney on it. I still have my emails from Rodney back in 2009 uh, and I pushed ahead. And yes, I got threats saying, don't do this, pull this. The prime minister's office even called into the conference and asked senior people to withdraw the motion. But fortunately, um, people like Duncan Kerr and Senator Carol Brown stood with me and we pushed forward and we defied the Prime Minister and we were the first uh, state branch to support marriage equality. It's my greatest achievement as a rank and file member. And I point that to queer people about why you should get involved in politics. Um, it's about um, getting involved and changing. And if you do have setbacks, and we will always have setbacks, then keep going because at some point you will achieve the change. Um, and I use that as an example of why to get involved. I think it also comes down to education. Not everyone is a bigot. Um, uh, some people are just ignorant and haven't been exposed to trans issues or uh, to LGBTIQ plus uh, issues. And it's about how to bring them and talk to them and, and seeing a different perspective rather than getting up in their face immediately calling them a bigot. I think that hardens people's position against you. Um, so there is a way to tackle this. Um, in terms of how we communicate, educate, bring people with us. Yes, when there are outright bigots, we take them on, we challenge them. Um, I'm proud as party secretary that obviously I had the representation there to show queer people within the Labor Party you can achieve any position within the party. We got Alison Standard elected in Franklin in 20, I don't know, 2018, and unfortunately she lost her seat. So we are now without any representation from the Labor Party in terms of uh, queer people in the parliament, but we do have three candidates on the ticket, myself, Ben Dudman in Lyons and Toby Thorpe in Franklin. So I'm hoping that one of us might get there. And again, as I said, it's about representation and showing people actually you can achieve anything. Don't let anybody define you. And if somebody does, keep going and prove them wrong because change will eventually come. Thanks, Stuart. Uh, Christy and um, Tamar. Yeah, uh, Tamar, do you want to go first? And then Christy, you can finish this off. You're on mute, Tamar. 
<laughs> Thank you. Um, I think that the idea that our leaders are beyond reproach is really outdated. And we've had lots of conversations now this election cycle around integrity. And I know that the people in this room are all working really hard from the inside and the out um, to to address integrity. But I think that that's something that's really, really important is, is community members and as candidates and members of parliament to really hold to that belief that oh. our leaders should be held up on bad behavior they should be pulled up on bad behavior um they're not above rules and regulations and 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 social and social norms um knowing that the job has a responsibility for equality and i think that that's something that's been a little bit murky a little bit muddied by party politics and party lines but also by the lack of diversity in in parliament and in leadership in general um and so really taking a a look at at ourselves as leaders and and remembering that it doesn't matter so much what our own personal beliefs are, our responsibility is to be representing community and community at all levels. And so I guess um, I think for the, the, those are some of the reasons that for me I like the idea of a coalition because I think that diversity in leadership, we haven't had enough of it yet. And the more diversity we get in leadership, the more the more we hear from from different community members, the more we will be able to each hold each other accountable in that leadership space. And I think that sometimes there is a trickle down. It is really important the way our leaders hold that space and the examples that they set for what is okay. Brilliant. Thanks, Tamar. And Christy, you've got one minute. One minute. Thank you, Rowan. Look, from my perspective in working in Parliament and obviously, you know, supporting and trying to push the government particularly to, to push forward on the ban and conversion practices. For me, it was about calling out those in Parliament who were standing on the wrong side of history here, but also calling out the bystanders within the Liberal Party. And I think we, we need to do that quite um, quite strongly, is to call out that bystander who, who says nothing and allows that kind of bigoted attitude to take place. You can do that by shaming them, but you can also do it by bigging them up and to, by supporting them to not be bystanders within their own parties, to actually speak out and be firm and, and to be positive and inclusive so it's a fine line between calling out those bystanders, but also by supporting them to do the right thing in their party and to, to stamp out that kind of bigoted attitude. So it, it's a double-edged sword um, and you've got to be really careful how you do it, and particularly when it comes to diverse parties like the Liberal Party who have very diverse views, but you really want to be there supporting those people in the party who are doing the right thing and making sure that they have every support around them to, to be um, inclusive. Thanks. Thanks, Christy and Tamar and Stuart. Um, we've reached the uh, time limit, it's 7 p.m. Um, and uh, so I think we should call, uh, draw things to a close. Uh, I'm sorry if there are people who haven't had a chance to have their questions answered, but of course, um, the candidates online, I'm sure, would be happy to take a call or an email uh, with your questions uh, on general issues or about particular policy issues. And don't forget, like I said at the beginning, that we have a, uh, an election page, www.quarterlytasmania.org.au slash election2024, that has the party and uh, independent responses to the survey that we sent out. Um, thanks to everyone who, who came along as participants tonight to ask questions and to hear what was being said. Thanks to the candidates uh, for being here. Um, Stuart's story then about the, um, the the landmark Tasmanian Labor Conference in 2009 and also Sue's story earlier about the 2019 legislation in Parliament and, um, and some of the other stories we've heard about important changes in Tasmania um, have had me reflecting on how we've all made a really important contribution to change and that collectively, even though the candidates are all competing against each other, particular even within the parties, thanks to the hair clerk system, we should still all be proud of the collective contribution we've made to a better Tasmania. And here's to an election outcome that will continue to move us forward. So thank you all very much. And thanks in particular to Rowan for arranging all the tech stuff that I had absolutely no idea about. <laughs> um, and uh, I, I wish you all luck uh, on Saturday. Thanks very much. Thanks, everybody. And thanks to thanks you, Rodney, for being a legend. Oh, that's very kind. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.
So uh, Rowan, I think, have you turned the uh, recording off yet?